right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the April Crop Production and WAS debriefings. My name is Lance Honig and I serve as Acting Chair of the Agricultural Statistics Board here at NAS. Uh, this briefing is for the Secretary of Agriculture and other policymakers at USDA to better understand the content and context of today's reports. We're very pleased to have Gloria Montano Green, USDA's Deputy Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation, join us as Secretary Designate today. And also happy to welcome Dr. Seth Meyer, USDA's Chief Economist. Uh, I'm also happy to share with you that we have a number of visitors with us today, uh, including a group of Cochrane Fellows from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate that. And then, and he is in the room at the moment. I'd also like to express our appreciation to Mark Hudson uh, from our Florida office, uh, who came in to assist us with the citrus portion of the reports today. Uh, before I turn things over to our presenters, I do have a few notes for our live streaming audience. Uh, the crop production and WASDE reports are considered principal federal economic indicator reports. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget provides specific guidance on how these important reports are to be released. In fact, OMB statistical policy instructs policymaking officials to refrain from making public comment regarding the content of these reports within 30 minutes of their release, so we will not be taking questions from the public during this briefing. Uh, both NAS and World Board staff will be available for phone or email questions, and NAS will host a social media event at 1 o'clock Eastern time this afternoon. Uh, we strive to have everything presented at this briefing match the official record. However, should there be any discrepancy, always refer to the official published estimates. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Nick Strepp. He is the acting chief of the crops branch here at NAS, and he will be immediately followed by Dr. Mark Jekinowski, chair of the World Ag Outlook Board. So Nick, podium is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be taking you through the April crop production report, which covers the current NAS estimates for citrus. First, our data sources for citrus. We have the objective measurement survey, which is conducted in Florida. This is a measurement of fruit size and a recording of drop fruit count. 769 groves were visited from March 18th to the 25th. Row counts are also completed in Florida to estimate the percent of the fruit harvested to date. The counts were conducted March 26th and 27th. NASA also reviews utilization data from the Florida Citrus Administrative Committee. These data include quantity of fruit packed or processed. For April, NASA can revise the previous year utilization for citrus. Last season's utilization was revised up for orange and grapefruit and down for lemons and tangerines. So the current US all orange production forecast is at 2.73 million tons. This is down 1.4% from the previous month, but up 7.3% from last year's revised utilization estimate. Florida all oranges are down 1 million boxes from last month, all in the Valencia category. California all oranges are unchanged from the previous forecast. Texas all oranges are up 150,000 boxes from the previous forecast. Non-Valencia oranges at 1.86 million tons are up 0.2% from last month and up 6.4% from last year. Valencia oranges at 877,000 tons are down 4.7% from last month, but up 9.2% from last year. Moving on to grapefruit, U.S. production is forecast at 353,000 tons, up 3.8% from the previous forecast and up 4.1% from last year. Looking state by state, Florida is down 200,000 boxes from last month. California production is up 300,000 boxes from the previous forecast. And Texas production is up 250,000 boxes from the previous forecast. U.S. lemon production at 922,000 tons is up 10.3% from the previous forecast, but down 15.9 from last year. U.S. tangerine production at 904,000 tons is unchanged from last month and down 6.3% from last year. Upcoming NAS reports include April 17th, the National Hemp Report, April 19th, Cattle on Feed, April 30th, Agricultural Prices, May 1st, the Current Agricultural Industrial Reports, 
May 7th, the non-citrus fruits and nuts annual report. May 10th, we have crop production, cotton ginnings annual report, and county estimates for cotton and peanuts. The 2024 USDA Spring Data Users Meeting is April 16th. Join the meeting virtually or in person in Chicago. Registration information can be found on the NAS website. Acting ASB Chair Lance Honig will conduct a crop production sat chat today at 1 p.m. Eastern on X. And as always, all this information and all reports for NAS can be found on our website at nas.usda.gov. This concludes the April crop production report. All right. And this begins the April WASD report. So let me walk you through the uh, uh, the WASD changes we did this month. Uh, my presentation won't be quite as quick as the previous one. We still got a lot of info to get through, but um, uh, but hopefully you'll find it uh, enlightening, interesting. So um, as you know, this month our focus is still on the April old crop, uh, focused on the old crop. Um, uh, conditions and, 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 and prospects. We'll have our new crop a year roll out in May. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, but still, we have a lot of have a lot of information to incorporate in, into our balance sheets this month, including many uh, new uh, a lot of new data that we got over the past few weeks. Um, grain stocks, rice stocks, uh, quarterly, quarterly hogs and pigs report, etc. So, and then we're also gonna focus a little bit on South Africa and Mexico corn production this month. So let's go ahead and get started with the uh, world wheat production. Uh, basically pretty small changes here, as you can see, mainly truing up to government data. Um, uh, maybe the one, uh, one point to uh, make note of here is um, uh, Northwest Africa, that is uh, a reduction in Tunisia where again, based on government data, uh, but that, that crop was cut by nearly half, just drought conditions much worse than we had expected. Uh, so uh, uh, that one does stand out. Global uh, balance sheet, a um, few things worth talking about here, uh, worth noting. Um, uh, we talked about production up a little bit. Uh, feed use uh, down overall globally. Um, Feed use in Russia is down, uh, reduced that a million uh, tons. Uh, exports out of Russia uh, also up, uh, strong exports out of Russia. Uh, EU feed use up a million tons, so some offsets there. Um, uh, total use uh, up a bit, uh, that's driven mainly by India. Um, where uh, they've just been, uh, Consuming out of stocks for food use in, in particular. Um, so India stocks actually down 2.1 per uh, 2.1 million tons. Um, uh, trade up uh, 1 1.3 million tons. Uh, exports from both Russia and Ukraine up, um, uh, partially offset by lower exports out of the EU, which were uh, reduced by 2 million tons. Ukraine exports uh, continue. Wheat exports continue strong. Um, uh, we raised uh, Ukraine's exports this month by one and a half million tons to 17 and a half million. And uh, global stocks tightening up just a bit again this month. And um, still, if, uh, if realized, these would be the lowest global ending stocks since 2015, 16. US balance sheet. Um, uh, imports down a bit, slower HRW imports there. Just again, just looking at pace um, uh, trade data there. Uh, feed and residual adjusted a bit lower, reflecting grain stocks, adjusting for the uh, usage from the uh, grain stocks report. And uh, ending stocks up a little bit, 25 million bushels. Um, and uh, maybe not too surprising, uh, prices down a bit, just a nickel. Uh, this crop at this point is, you know, mostly marketed so those prices aren't going to move a whole lot uh with uh additional uh with even you know any additional changes in the cash prices 
world rice production uh, again here just really truing up the production data to um, uh, recent government reports and post reports uh, post reports from the from Bangladesh and Indonesia uh, in, in particular uh, driving those changes um, government data out of the Philippines suggesting that uh, rice crop is a little bit uh, larger than uh, than we had expected despite El Nino so but when it's all added up uh, it leads to relatively small really very small change in global um, global rice supplies balance sheet uh, changes here uh, beginning stocks uh, that mainly reflects uh, some back year changes adjustments to Cambodia and Burma uh, stocks in, in those two countries um, otherwise for you know the rest of the balance sheet China is is, is playing a large um, role in 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 many of these other changes total use down um, one and a half million tons. That's mainly China. Reports that they're just auctioning fewer uh, rice supplies um, out of their stock. So then also the ending global ending stocks up two and a half million tons. That's also mostly in China, higher stocks there. Uh, trade, um, uh, some higher exports out of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Burma. U.S. rice balance sheet. Uh, uh, again, basically truing up to the rice stocks report um, uh, regarding domestic use, uh, so uh, lower domestic use, but the uh, maybe the more interesting uh, story here is strong export pace. Uh, that's all long grain rice, rough rice to Western Hemisphere um, regular markets. So long grain rice uh, exports, actually, we raised 4 million tons offset by a 1 million ton reduction in short medium grain. Um, so even with those stronger exports, though, uh, with the lower domestic use ending stocks up a bit, two million hundred weight, and uh, we didn't make any change in the uh, season average market price. So let's move into corn. Uh, a few things to discuss here. We're going to talk in some detail about Mexico and South Africa, uh, where those are two countries uh, suffering uh, some pretty severe drought conditions. Um, Argentina uh, production down a million tons uh, this month, mainly reflecting early harvest results. About 10% of that crop is harvested so far. Um, EU, uh, again, truing up to official data there. Uh, basically, what we're seeing is lower production out of, out of uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and uh, higher in Poland, Spain, and Hungary. Um, also, higher in Serbia, noted there as well. Uh, similar. Uh, uh, similar crop conditions in Serbia as uh, to those uh, countries in EU where production has been higher as well. Um, uh, FSU uh, down, um, you notice we didn't change Ukraine or Russia, so that reduction is all in Moldova. And uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, um, Mexico and South Africa. So with Mexico, we're going to be focused here on the um, winter corn production. Um, so this is the smaller crop, but uh, you know, but but it's the crop that will be harvested just within a few weeks from now. So uh, critical um, uh, critical weather conditions, uh, crop conditions occurred over the past month or so, February, March, uh, and, and we'll be you know harvesting toward the end of April. And it's been dry. And you can see here too, in, from this crop calendar, most of the production, winter crop production, uh, occurs in Sinaloa. Now, you, uh, you're aware of this, and you've heard me mention it many times, especially in the sugar briefing as well. But Mexico has been suffering a pretty severe drought across most of the country. So this is the uh, drought conditions as of uh, the end of October. Uh, you know, looking at, again, this is the area where we're interested in with regard to uh, Sinaloa, that winter crop uh, production. Uh, so that's end of October. This is the really the critical time for that crop development. Things only got worse. Um, important to note as well that uh, most of this crop uh, produced in that area is irrigated. So with these drought conditions, lack of rain, uh, reservoirs are low, uh, and they just um, you know don't have the water to uh, to, um, uh, to to irrigate as they would need to to get good yields. 
So uh, reservoir conditions in most of these areas where we're focused in on are you know at 15% capacity or less. Um, and you can also see it from satellite data. This is one of the major uh, reservoirs that feeds this area. Uh, so 2013, uh, the size of the reservoir compared to this year uh, severely uh, diminished. So reducing that uh, water availability for irrigation. Now I'll note that uh, we had some FAS staff who did a crop tour to this part of the country just a few weeks ago. It's a dangerous part of the world. They had to go with high security. Oops, sorry, I don't wanna. Uh, they had to go with pretty high security while they were traveling out in the country. Uh, but uh, there you got our uh, Justin Jenkins, our uh, FAS crop analyst, uh, looking at the uh, crops out there in, in Mexico, some other FAS analysts out there. And, um, and then, of, of course, this guy on the, on the roof with the uh, artillery, that's, uh, that's Bob Tetro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, I think that they had a good trip and uh, an, an important trip, but in, uh, truly in an area the, in the world that, uh, uh, where risks are high. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, South Africa. Oh, let me also just note, because uh, it, it is important, and this will come up again later, most of that uh, corn in, in Mexico, as you might know, it's 90% white. So, uh, so it's food use. Um, now, South Africa, um, it, kind of some you know in, interesting developments here too. We're gonna talk a little bit here about uh, corn, soybeans, and sunflower seed, main crops in South Africa. Um, now, kind of the, the interesting weather developments that, that we saw in South Africa over the past several months is that, again, despite El Nino, um, the rains were really good early in the season, uh, you know, surprisingly good. And uh, that did a few things. I think it, it encouraged farmers to plant soybeans instead of switching to sunflower seeds, which sunflowers, which tend to be a little bit more drought tolerant. And, uh, and it certainly built up expectations of a of a good crop, uh, you know, good production for all of these crops, including corn this year. But as you can see, uh, toward the end of January and then into February, those rains just shut off. Um, extremely dry from the middle of February on. Uh, and it also has been uh, hot. So conditions really cratered, um, you know, just during the critical time of crop development. Uh, and uh, and we can see it in the um, uh, in the vegetative health index, just for comparison. And I'll note it here uh, here as well. 2015-16 was the last fairly serious El Nino, so that's why that one is up there for comparison. And then similarly with the uh, vegetative health index, um, we have this year on the on the left and and 2016 on the right. You can see the conditions generally. Especially in the West, they're worse this year, uh, but it's noteworthy that most of the white corn production in South Africa occurs in, in the West, uh, Western regions. So, um, uh, so particularly bad uh, there, white corn production this year. And there too, we had some FAS crop tra uh, tra travel um, during February. Kurt Reynolds spent about three weeks out and uh, uh, traveling uh, across much of Africa. And uh, so, so here we are. Uh, implications of, um, of of the drought and and heat uh, across these three commodities. Just uh, pretty sharp reductions in yields for uh, for all three of those this year, this month, I should say. All right. So, um, world corn balance sheet. Um, Beginning stocks, uh, mainly just some uh, truing up use data. That, that's uh, mainly changes in South Africa. Uh, and uh, let's see what else can I tell you about. So supply, we talked about production. So supply down this month, 1.8 million tons. Uh, feed use uh, down, uh, lowered this month by 2.7 million tons. Uh, that reflects uh, lower feed use in Argentina, Moldova, and South Africa, reflecting smaller crops there. Uh, lower feed use in Saudi Arabia, um, lower imports um, by so Saudi Arabia, and offset a bit by higher feed use in the U.S., which we'll talk about in the next slide. 
Um, uh, trade uh, down a bit, uh, lower exports out of South Africa, smaller crop, and uh, um, and also uh, lower exports out of India, uh, where they're using more for domestic markets. Uh, ending stocks down, and that is also um, uh, almost entirely a U.S. Uh, lower stocks in, uh, in the U.S. So the U.S. balance sheet, um, again, kind of truing up to the uh, quarterly grain stocks report. So, uh, you know, based on quarterly disappearance, we raised feed and residual uh, use 25 million bushels. Um, ethanol use also up 25 million bushels. Uh, just reflecting the pace of crushing and, and recent uh, EIA data. Uh, margins have been good. Uh, fuel prices are high. Corn, uh, gasoline prices are high. Um, corn prices are low. So um, uh, so we've been seeing a little bit of higher production there. And um, and then when, uh, when you add it all up, ending stocks tighten up 50 million bushels. Uh, at season average market price, we lowered 5 cents per bushel, uh, just um, again, based on reported prices to date. Maybe no surprise there. Let's move into soybeans. Uh, so uh, global production uh, up a bit in Paraguay, uh, good conditions there, uh, but uh, that is offset by um, 300,000 ton reduction in South Africa, which again, we just talked about South Africa, not listed there as, as one of the main countries, but that is the difference that's leading to the um, world reduction of about 100,000 tons this month. Uh, soybean balance sheet, global. Uh, beginning stocks, um, basically various uh, balance sheet revisions from past years, uh, truing up uh, some supply and use data, especially for Canada, EU, Iran, and Russia. And uh, not much to say about uh, crush or um, ending stocks. Uh, trade down a bit this month that is mainly uh, lower ex exports out of the U.S. and South Africa, again, smaller crop, partially offset um, by uh, higher exports out of Paraguay. U.S. balance sheet um, imports uh, adjusted a little bit lower just based on uh, observed trade data and, and, and pace to date. Uh, Seed and residual down, uh, again, reflecting uh, just uh, truing up to the March 1 stocks re uh, report and also making some seed use adjustments based on prospective planting. Um, uh, exports down, um, again, based on, uh, just based on the recent pace and expectations of shipments going forward and uh, ending stocks, as you can see, up by 25 million bushels. Um, season average price lower 10 cents per bushel. And, uh, and at this point where, you know, we've got roughly three quarters of that crop is marketed. Cotton, very few changes globally this month. So um, hardly any uh, changes for the current crop year uh, for cotton. Uh, they add up over uh, many small countries, they add up to a total of 33,000 bale increase of, in supply for, for this year. But so I put up the back year just because we did have a little bit uh, of new data there. Uzbekistan um, lowered uh, 100,000 bales just based on ginning data. And uh, just worth noting, it uh, takes Uzbekistan a long time to finalize that data. So that's, uh, you know, uh, in the previous crop year. Um, cotton supply and demand uh, globally. Uh, largely a China story again this month. Uh, China consumption raised 500,000 bales, um, but that's more than offset by lower consumption in other countries. Um, uh, trade also up. That is also driven by uh, largely by increased imports by China. Uh, China imports, we raised 1.3 million bales. Uh, and that is offset by lower um, imports by Pakistan, Indonesia, and various other countries. Um, and then uh, also uh, we, we're seeing some higher exports out of India, Turkey, and Kazakhstan. Um, and again, as, as I've noted in uh, uh, last month's briefing, and I think others, much of that uh, increased 
imports by China are going into uh, going replenishing their stocks. U.S. cotton balance sheet, no changes this month on it. Uh, any of the uh, variables, but we did reduce season average price. Uh, brought it back back down by a penny a pound, just reflecting recent observed prices, softening of those prices. All right, let's talk about sugar. Sugar is always complicated this month. It seems even more so. But we're going to, again, start the discussion with the Mexico balance sheet as we have for the past a few months because it's really Mexico that's driving the U.S. situation as well. Note here uh, that we again reduced Mexico's uh, sugar production. This is, I don't know how many months in a, in a row we've reduced it, but um, here we are again. Uh, in this case, now we're seeing um, reduced area, increased abandonment, uh, ac actually a little bit higher recovery in yields, but still that lower area and abandonment is driving production lower. Um, Mexico imports uh, raised uh, 81,000 metric tons. Now, this is a little. This is where it starts to get a little bit complicated. Just last week, Mexico suspended the duty on uh, imports for sugar to the IMEX program. So, sugar that would be that can be directed into the IMEX program can now enter Mexico duty free, at least temporarily. So, much of this 81,000 ton increase this month is um uh is from the u.s going into mexico going into the imex program and then some of that uh sugar that mexico would have put into the imex program is diverted into domestic use um so that's uh the higher domestic use there mexico exports reduced 124,000 metric tons um again much of that uh, to the u.s the share of low pole sugar uh, in Mexico is declining. Now we're pegging it at about 7%. We started again, remember at 11.5% and last month we were at 9%. Um, and this is just kind of reflecting the reality that the price of low pole sugar is lower. So uh, providing the, uh, uh, you know, diverting to produce the uh, Estrondar sugar is more profitable. So that's reducing available uh, supplies to export uh, low pole to the U.S. So let's talk about the U.S. sugar balance sheet um, within within that context. Um, U.S. production, small adjustment there, reduced uh, beet production, 27,000 short tons, just reflecting uh, <clears throat> information we have on lower recovery. Um, and uh, let's talk about export uh, imports next. Uh, TRQ imports raised 25,000 tons. Uh, so basically what we did there is re we reduced the shortfall 25,000 tons, um, reflecting expectations that Argentina and Panama will supply more than, than we originally assumed. Um, Mexico, I uh, talked about that. So I'll... Uh, Imports uh, from Mexico down 167,000 short ton raw value. And again, that recognizing we're changing units here for folks in the room. That's why that 167,000 doesn't exactly match up with the uh, 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 number I had in the Mexico balance sheet. It's just a change in units. Um, high tier sugar, we increased again. Uh, so now up to uh, 855,000 short tons. And basically what we're looking at here, uh, we're halfway through the marketing year and uh, and so far, six months in, we have imported um, about half of this amount through the high tier. So, uh, so we expect the second half of the year to be similar to the first half. And um, so based on pace to date, we're looking at high tier imports of about, uh, again, 855,000 short tons. Um, uh, exports uh, raised a bit this month. Those are mainly those re-exports to Mexico into their IMEX program. And um, and when you account for all the changes, our stocks use ratio lands right at 13.5%. Uh, just coincidentally, this isn't a month where we target 13.5%. So there you go on sugar. Uh, so we can wrap things up here with livestock, meat and livestock. Uh, beef production uh, raised this month 130 million 
pounds, uh, mainly reflecting, well, entirely reflecting both the higher slaughter and higher weights, um, higher uh, slaughter of both cat cattle, uh, fed cattle and cows, but a larger proportion of uh, an increase in fed cattle, raising those uh, weights as well. Uh, pork production adjusted higher uh, this month through reflecting the hogs and pigs report, and you were at the briefing, so you know what those um, factors are, including um, uh, farrowing intentions not down not as much as originally expected, uh, pig crop revised higher, and uh, the sustained growth in pigs per litter uh, that that report showed. Um, broiler production up. 230 million pounds, uh, mainly reflecting higher weights along with slightly higher uh, sets and placements and turkey production virtually unchanged this month. Prices, steer prices adjusted higher uh, by $2.51 per hundred weight, just reflecting uh, uh, observed uh, steer prices and, uh, you know, which are being supported by strong, continued strong beef demand. And uh, hog prices, we raised by $2.24 per hundred weight. We're seeing a strong carcass value and also pretty strong export demand, which I'll show in the next slide. Uh, our broilers up a bit, again, just observe, observe prices. And turkey, uh, you know, last month we raised it. We saw it, we, we, were, we were optimistic, uh, saw some strength in turkey prices, but that did not last long. Uh, so we're just seeing persistent poor demand on the turkey side and prices continuing to fall. U.S. meat trade, um, beef up just a little bit, to, again, just truing up to the more recent, more recent trade data. Uh, pork exports, uh, uh, kind of uh, highlight there is, is, is uh, pretty strong. You look at uh, strong growth year over year and, and a pretty big increase this month as well. Uh, just seeing increased competition, uh, increased competitiveness with EU and, um, and uh, uh, selling to many different markets as well. Uh, broiler um, exports down a bit on the other hand, and that just is reflecting, as I showed in the previous slide, higher U.S. prices and uh, many of these markets that we sell broilers to are highly price sensitive. No change in our beef imports this month. Dairy. Uh, um, dairy production uh, adjusted a little bit lower this month and would be flat year over year. Uh, so the, and the adjustment this month just reflects lower growth in output per cow. Uh, dairy trade, uh, main thing to highlight here on the uh, dairy trade side is uh, strong domestic and global demand for butter. So in terms of fat basis, um, uh, raised our imports that is driven by uh, largely by butter as well as some other products as well. Exports are also uh, um, higher exports of butter as well as so strong demand for global demand for butter and also some higher um, exports of cheese where we're uh, just uh, seeing more price competitiveness there. Uh, on a skim solids basis, um, main thing I'd point out there, lower exports, um, mainly driven by lower global demand, especially for lactose and whey. It's driving that reduction to, uh, this month. Dairy product prices, wrapping things up here. Again, the uh, main, uh, main story that jumps out is, uh, the, is butter and uh, strong global and domestic demand, pulling those prices higher. Um, relative to all of the other major uh, dairy products where we're observing lower prices. Class prices, uh, class three price uh, lowered this month, 95 cents per hundred weight. Uh, that is mainly reflecting those lower cheese and whey prices. Class four prices raised 30 cents per hundred weight, reflecting those that strength in the butter price and the all milk price um, comes out to 35 cents per hundred weight lower this month, but still up a bit year over year, as you can see. So that is all I have uh, with the WASD. I hope that uh, answered some of your questions. I tried to hit most of the key points of the, the, uh, the things, the, the thought process that went into the numbers this month um, for all of folks online. Thank you for 
for joining and uh, we will see you back next month in May when we roll out our first new year, first outlook for the uh, official outlook for the new crop year. And with that, I will wrap it up and turn it over to you for questions.